Okay, so good afternoon. Before we start the session, I repeat the, the sequence of uh, the speakers. We are going to start with uh, Peter van der Heiden. Then we are going to move to Hubertus Weyer. Uh, then to Professor Isaac Frumi. Uh, then Nuno is number four. And uh, I will be number five, whatever time you know I will have here. Since I'm here, it will be more convenient for me. So we have started um, the recording. I would like to welcome you to the 22nd uh, Meitan National Conference that happens every year in, here in the uh, Rabin Center in Israel. The topics of um, the conference uh, are mainly focused in education, uh, pedagogies and technologies. So this is uh, what we are, we are trying to cover in this international track. The international track happens every year with the framework of this um, METAL conference. METAL is the inter-computational um, center that serves all the Israeli universities here in Israel, uh, offering you know, tools, technology tools, and uh, he tries to organize and support the, the training of uh, professors and, teach, and students you know, regarding new technologies applied in higher education. So it's a great pleasure that um, my name is Kostas and um, I'm pretty sure that we have met uh, each other. And it's a, um, it's a nice gathering between friends and people that we, have a, we are sharing a vision for a more inclusive, more um, a, a more a, a, a more a innovative higher education regarding pedagogies and technologies. So it's a great pleasure to welcome the first speaker. Uh, Peter, you can share your screen. Uh, it's uh, Peter van der Heiden. He's a consultant, a very experienced consultant in higher education and higher education strategies. And he he has a great vision, not only about the topic that he's going to speak to, speak to us, uh, he's going to speak about, uh, to us, you know, today. Uh, he has worked uh, for more than 20, 30, uh, 23 years in European Commission, where he was the head of sector of higher education policy. Uh, he's very much involved in the European University Alliance Initiative, and he has succeeded um, to, uh, coordinate, to coordinate, to consult successfully 10 over the 64 of the existing alliances. Um, among, other, among other expertise that he demonstrates is like his vision and his work ar around micro-credentials and how micro-credentials can be applied for a more modern and more inclusive um, higher education. The title of his contribution today is micro-credentials, uh, demystified and scale. And the floor is yours, um, uh, Peter, for the next uh, 15 minutes. Please try to share your screen and thank you very much. Hello, uh, everybody. Very nice to be here. Grateful that you invited me. Uh, I have a short presentation in three parts. I can share my screen from time to time, not all the time. And so that you don't forget my face, I put my face to the left of this screen here. Uh, the the micro-credentials. Uh, it's, I put it in a three-part presentation. Uh, first, the context, the global context. Then, uh, what the record branches really are. What, what, what is this animal? You know what it is, but it's, uh, it's still very confused and, and fluid out there that people don't know really what, what they talk about. They, they look at it in, from very different angles to the same phenomenon. And uh, most important, how can we scale it? How can we make it happen? And we are all in various stages of development. For some, things will be uh, already uh, common practice. And that's good to be here also for me in this seminar to learn from what you are doing. My first um, um, notion is uh, the context. We have, we have a global learning crisis. Yeah? We have a, a, an expanding population, especially in the global south, and we are underserving them. Uh, we don't have enough offer for learning at our traditional institutions. We have to think of different ways to reaching out to those uh, citizens because the, uh, the, the demand for learning is in principle unlimited. People love to learn. Man is a compulsive learner. 
you want to learn new things when you wake up, when you find a magazine, uh, when you're at a hairdresser, you're disappointed when it's the magazine of last week because you want to learn something new. Even the, 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 the man in the village who is not so smart, you think he's not so smart, but he knows all the number plates of the cars of the inhabitants and knows all the football players going back to the 20s. So learning is, is innate to a human being and we are not addressing this enough. The offer of learning is also gigantic. We have our universities with all their programs. We have companies, we have NGOs. Uh, I always say the fire brigade of Manila. I have never been in the Philippines, but I'm sure they have a course how to fight fires in high buildings. That's a micro-credential. Everything out there is a micro-credential. And uh, we have been doing conferences about lifelong learning all my life. When I was young, it was called Education Permanente. And we were still speaking French in those days. But we forgot to connect the offer and the demand in a systematic manner. And this is now possible because the technology is there. The uh, pedagogy is there. We have had enormous insights in how to do a micro-credential online and offline. And the demand and the offer is there. There's a necessity recognized. So we can pull these factors together. In the OECD, it's quite all right. People doing 30, 40% courses in the last few years. In the global south, it is far less where the need is much higher. There's also a degree monopoly. We are fixed on degrees, whereas what the employers like is competences. Half the staff hired at IBM, almost half, for complicated jobs that, that normally would require a bachelor or master, half of those jobs are taken by people without the degree. And they are doing better. They're more loyal to the company because they can't move to the city because the city requires you to have a, a degree. And they have more diverse life experience. So degrees are fine, but they are references. What is more important is the learning underneath a degree, the competence in there. And that's, we can exploit, I'm talking mainly with university audiences, we can exploit that in a far more systematic manner. That is my thesis. And to talk with you about scaling, uh, I first would like to show you my definition and you see my definition on screen, uh, a micro-credential, what, what is it? It is basically a small volume of competences. I know something, I can do something. That's a competence. And it's not comparable to a full uh, professional profile or a career. It's a segment. It's a small part. And this is competences. You can call it qualification. And you obtain those qualifications. How? Well, through life. Uh, I learned uh, English, French, and German from television through work, on the job. And you can also, guess what? You can also acquire competences through a course. That's called study. But I put study last, which always shocks my university audiences. I put study last. Most learning, the biggest chunk of the learning in your life is from your family from your, your friends, from your television, reading, music, walking around, sports, work. I learned most of the things I know from my colleagues, looking, looking to them, listening to them. And yes, the occasional course. That is important to keep that hierarchy in mind and to uh, realize that a micro-credential is not a course. A micro-credential is a certified volume of competences. So it's like a piece of paper. And people have difficulty with that. They think it's, uh, it's about modules, it's about courses. No, modules and courses are a source of learning that leads you to this certificate. But if you look at uh, in comparison to the bachelor and the master, it's very much the same. Because yeah, a bachelor is three years of study, some countries four years. It is also a piece of paper. It's a certificate. Same for the master. It's one or two years. It's also a certificate, a qualification. So the micro-credential is simply a very small 
piece of learning, bit of competence as compared to a bachelor and master. So there is nothing magic about it. And that's an issue, I don't know, in your country, but in the, in the EU, generally, uh, universities and also clubs of universities, alliances, they think that the micro-credential is something new. It is something for the labor market. It is something online. Well, it doesn't need to be new. It doesn't need to be for the labor market. It doesn't need to be uh, online or offline. All the modules in the universities that I meet, all the modules are micro-credentials today. So if you have uh, 20 programs, bachelor's, master's, they take three years, then you have 90 years, you have six modules, six times 90, you have 360 micro-credentials, if I count well. Every university, is, every university has hundreds if not thousands of micro-credentials who are simply waiting to be unleashed. Of course, you cannot follow every micro-credential, every module, because it's hidden, it's locked up in a program. So what you can do over time, year one, year two, year three, unlock your golden nuggets and make them accessible under the conditions. There's also... Uh, Prerequisites. I cannot follow a module nuclear physics in year four because I'm a simple lawyer. But other people can. Prerequisites are not disappearing. They are there, but make it transparent. I come to speak about that in terms of scaling. So my summary, there are many summaries, the definition of micro-credentials, sometimes it involves quality assurance, sometimes it involves the labor market, it involves the triangle, it involves all kinds of factors, but you have to, like an onion, you take out, out of the layers, and what you find underneath is simply a small volume of confidences. And to make it known to the world that you have them, you get a certificate somewhere, from university, from a certifier, from the post office, I don't care. That is what the micro-credential boils to. The offer is endless. Look at the fire brigade in Manila. And the demand is endless. Look at the learners, the new learners that are being born every day, for which there are no buildings, no electricity, uh, no teachers, which we have to learn how to serve in the years ahead. Now, how to scale the production, how to make it happen, these, how to unleash these treasures, which are in universities, but also in other training institutes, also in the, in the, at the Red Cross, also at the Fire Brigade of Manila. Every entity in the world, all the people I see on screen, you can design a micro-credential. You have a specific knowledge that you can share with others as an individual as a department, as a faculty, as a university, as a company, as an NGO, as a, in all these uh, combinations of people and knowledge and experience, we can become knowledge producers. Now, sounds a bit chaotic, so you need some degree, not too much, of organization. And that's what I call the multi-actor game in public-private partnerships. How many minutes I have left? Five more. Five, Five more. more for you. Five? Fine. Yeah. No, no problem. No problem. So, uh, who who are who are in this multi actor game? And uh, I, I distinguish uh, uh, different actors, public, private. Uh, here, I start with the not with the with the teachers. I should have to be sympathetic, but I start with the with the with the with the states and with the industry, with the econ economic actors. So the state has a very important role, the public authorities, because they can regulate the national uh, and also subject-specific qualifications framework. And we've done that in the EU. M most many countries in the world have done it. We, we've took, we took the idea from South Africa, I believe, in, in, in Europe and from, from New Zealand and from Scotland. The national framework describes the, the levels from primary to secondary, bachelor, master, doctorate, and a generic description of the competence. What can a bachelor do? What can a master do? The learning outcomes, the, the, the skills. And this has been taken up by groups of academics. There's a project called Tuning, which have 
describes the bachelor and the master for a uh, specific fields like nursing or law or physics. And these are references for you. If you want to design your own course, you go to the national framework, you look at the European framework, you look at the subject specific, and they're all in tune. Let me reassure you, they're all in tune and they help you as a provider to situate your piece of competences and piece of learning and certificate and test if you're a tester. The nice thing of this phenomenon, these uh, qualification framework is that they provide context, context reference. You can slot in all the learning in the qualifications frameworks, which makes your learning production cons consumption extremely readable. Employers have a role to do. They can, they can advise the, the, the designers they can even help to fund. Uh, trade unions can plead for more learning. In the media, we can make it popular. We can have a, have a, a soap, a TV series on uh, learning. What is important in uh, the exercise is that you have the framework. That's uh, uh, what I just described, of the learning outcomes at the various levels, that you have some money to follow a course. That is called... Uh, individual learning account. And with individual learning account in France, every citizen has 500 euros and can buy a course, a course that matches a qualification. And how many qualifications are there in the course in the list in France? 30,000, 30,000 and growing. So that's uh, a role to play as a state to set the rules of the game as companies to fund your workers as individuals to buy or to follow a course, the state or your grandmother to put money on your individual learning accounts. Now, where can I find the micro-credentials? Because we can talk about it uh, till we fall over. Uh, you need transparency. So there are platforms like the MOOC platforms that you know, there are all kinds of registers and these registers, it sounds bureaucratic, yeah? but the French have a register of qualifications, introduction to uh, to French, introduction to uh, artificial intelligence, introduction to bookkeeping. That's a register of competences, of, of qualifications. Behind every qualification, there are courses. In Marseille, you have one course for this, one course for that, public, private, online in another country. And those are courses that are uh, approved by the state, by the providers, by the companies. So these registers are extremely important where you can find as a, you know, this phenomena, your wallet, you can find where are my courses, where are the qualifications that I've acquired already, what course that I have will give me a, a credit waiver. So universities should be transparent about the courses they offer, the short courses, the modules, the micro-credentials, the qualifications, they should be transparent about what they recognize. If you are transparent about your what you recognize, you can picture as a learner your study path. So transparency is extremely important in the scaling of micro-credentials. And for this, you need course catalogs, but also catalogs of reliable providers, accredited institutions. You need list of testers, reliable testers. And if you have this in place and you can build it gradually. You can start in, a, I, I was talking to the government of Jamaica, you can start with three universities, three qualifications, three providers, three testers, three learners, and double this number every second week. In the backstage, you have quality assurance, you have admission officers, <clears throat> but they should have a, 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 an arm's length approach. They can also set some rules. They can advise universities and other providers how to be qualitative, but they should not assess and accredit every ind individual micro-credential, in my view. Uh, actors, now more to the to the backs, to the to the to yeah, to be on stage, so not the back office. You have, of course, the learners, all ages and backgrounds. You have the testers. The tester can be the university, but can also be someone else. Why should it be the university? In Germany, you have the start exam. The university doesn't do the exam for lawyers and doctors, for example. You have the awarders. Who awards a micro-credential to the learner so to he or she can put it in the wallet? It can be university. It can be a professional body. It can be the state. It can be others. 
Hence the importance of these registers where you can find all this stuff. Otherwise it becomes fluid and a chaos. So there's a role for the public authorities to play in concert with the private sector and the education sector. The course providers, if you want to do a course to obtain the micro-credential, you have to find this course in their catalogs. You can also get your micro-credential simply by doing a test. I could do a test for my knowledge of, of French language without doing any course. This is also a route to micro-credentials that universities and other providers should pick up. As a proud institution, university, you should not only teach, you should also certify. And you can hand out every year 1,000 or 300 degrees. You can hand out every year 3,000 or 30,000 micro-credentials to the people that you have tested according to your standards. So our actors can multiply quadruple, quintuple, 10 times, 100 times the qualifications that they are awarding today. So we break open the system, we break open the degree uh, monopoly. Here's a relevant publication, UNESCO uh, early last year. You find a summary of what I, uh, or not a summary, you find a longer text describing the steps and the responsibility for each actors, as I outlined it now in my presentation. And as a uh, former EU official, I can recommend the twin EU Council recommendations of 22 that describes the market credentials, uh, being uh, competences, certified, quality assurance, credits, certificates, all, all, everything that the bachelor has, a micro credential has. That's the first recommendation. And the second one, the twin sisters, is the individual learning account. How to encourage learners, seduce them and seduce their employers and their parents and grandparents to have an account with not only your air miles, but also your credits of the things that you've learned. That is called an individual learning account. And it gives the actor, it makes the students, the learners, the agents, the prime agents in the game. And don't you worry, people go for serious courses. They want to build their life and they want to learn things that are relevant to them but you're also free to do something that is simply for your own self-development. So let's organize it, colleagues, in your country, globally, within your university, within your networks, that we make the gigantic offer meet the gigantic demand. It needs some unlocking, it needs some unleashing, it needs a few rules of the game, and the ball gets rolling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for this very insightful and uh, visionary talk. Um, probably we have um, five minutes for the first questions, and then you know we can have more questions at the end. Uh, anyone, uh, please raise your hand in order to give you the floor. In the uh, from the audience here, do we have any questions? I have one, and always, you know, Peter, this is like. What is the smallest, you know, the smallest amount of knowledge that you can link them, you can link it with micro credentials? Is like the learning outcomes or is the competence? Because the competence probably needs more than one learning outcome. And uh, who defines this? The ESCO taxonomy, for example, that connects competencies with learning outcomes. This is my question. The smallest unit in a, in nanotechnology, we have let's say the scale of nanometer. Uh, but you know, in in, in micro credentials, what is the smallest? It's, you mentioned about competencies. Competencies probably they need more learning outcomes. I thought that I can link the learning outcome and not the competence. Even a learning outcome can be linked through the ESCO taxonomy with a competence. So, what is your advice? The smallest volume. What is the smallest volume? If we can define. This yeah, is my first uh, question. Small... 
and and this yeah. is my first question and my second question always i push my university to introduce micro credentials and then i have a a, a colleague of mine that he told me aha uh, how are you going to title micro credential uh, i said to him okay alignment of a laser cavity oh yes you are going to name it the alignment of laser cavity but the university in thessaloniki they are going to name it differently who is going to compare uh, the similarity of the micro credentials yeah uh I'm in, uh, in many panels and mo mo uh, most uh, of the time my answer is relax, anything goes. <laughs> so, uh, but to be more specific, uh, uh, I, 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 would, I would go for uh, learning outcomes. Okay. And the learning outcomes in the, in the, in the EU is, is uh, all three. It's knowledge, it's, understand, it's uh, understanding, uh, complex skills and how to do things. And it's the level of autonomy which which you undertake your activity. So the mother notion, depending on who you speak, is competences, it's learning outcomes, or it's skills, employers like skills. Universities don't like it because it sounds like plumbers. The neutral, uh, more, more, most neutral definition of what you learn or what you can do is learning outcomes, which has the three parts, the, the knowledge, the skills, and the autonomy which which you undertake it. This is then described, coming to your second question, in a micro-credential. And there, uh, anything goes. The, it's the provider that decides. You decide how you name it. And it doesn't need to be equivalent to the micro-credential of another institution. Why should it be? Uh, it, it, can be it can be delivered by a single institution, by two or three or four. It can lead to a single certificate of a single institution or a joint certificate or how do you call it in parallel double and and uh, and triple multiple uh, nini or it can be uh, uh, delivered the certificate by three or four institutions acting as one all these things you know what the employer couldn't care less as long as you have a transparency you. what you know and can do Thank you, Peter. Very clear and direct uh, answers. Uh, one more question I have I will have from Nuno, Nuno Espuderio, a professor from IPP, one of the panelists later on. Nuno, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, great to see you, Peter. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for the presentation. So Hello. my question is related to trust. How can we make companies trust this? Because as you say, a micro-credential might be or is a paper, I can have a micro-credential without attending a course because I already mastered these competencies. But I believe that the labor market is expecting you to say, okay, I did this course to get this competence. Uh, so isn't this somehow undermining the trust that companies might have, the fact that this is so open and so dynamic? Can I answer on this? Can, can I test my answer on this? Because sure. I, I was thinking of this. I think, Nuno, that we should engage the companies in the quality assurance step. If you are going to include them in the quality assurance step, they are going to trust because it's going to be their own um, under their own uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, condition. But this is my answer because I was thinking of this. Uh, Peter is the expert, not me. Uh, Peter. Okay. Yeah. Well, great, great to see you, uh, Nuno. Uh, the, the, the answer is we have the Olympics now in Paris. So uh, let's, let's look to what the French have done. They have this... Registre uh, de compétences, certificat professionnel. That's a, a list of qualifications, not courses. Qualifications: introduction to artificial intelligence, introduction to old Greek, introduction to accounting, and it's a qualification. So it's it's like this. It's a very sh a short piece of paper. It describes what the person who has uh, who has who has this uh, competences, what he or she knows and can do. So it's very clear, very transparent. And this text, I have it in my hands, is agreed by the state, employers, employers associations, experts, and providers. So it's a tripartite. So it has a high, very high trust from the employers, from the uh, organization of providers, and from the, uh, from the state. And it's on the internet, it's called France Competence. And now I live in Marseille, I want to do introduction to accounting. 
and I click on this qualification says, yes, I, I, I would like to have that qualification. And then I click on courses and I see that in my city, there's a public institution, a private, there's a company, there's an online course in, 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 in Porto. You pick the online course in Porto, you follow the course, you get a certificate, and, uh, and then 50 euro is gone from your account, huh? your individual learning account. And uh, once you finish the course, you get a phone call from an employer in Marseille. Can we speak? How is this possible? Because you have given permission for that. All right. And em employers in the whole of France can see the people that have done the latest course in artificial intelligence. And they trust the course because it's a trusted provider linked to a trusted qualification. And it's very bureaucratic, but it demands a register of qualifications, of courses, of testers, And of grand right, and grandmothers right. that put money on there instead of giving you money for a holiday. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. So I cannot see the okay. There's a question from the chat. Yeah, so it's okay. I don't can you read out what's the question you want to I be answered? I mute my. The question from the, from the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't work. Let's. Let me see the question from the chat. Okay. Sorry for typing my questions for the sake of point. What is the difference between a lifelong courses or university offers the number of them and micro credential? The, my answer is anything goes. Relax. <laughs> so. Everything that comes out of your mouth as a teacher is uh, leads to, to, to knowledge and learning. And this the big misunderstandings, huh? that what one myth is uh, uh, my credential about lifelong learning. Not true. Well, true. No, but they mean it's, it's continuing education. So after my university, I need a course. No, the module that you get in year one in your undergraduate, the first module you get, Introduction to Dutch Law, I did a long time ago, was a micro-credential. When Socrates was talking at Agora with his pupils in Athens about uh, uh, the stars or about uh, the nature of, of uh, the elements, uh, Plato, Socrates, uh, Aristoteles, uh, uh, when they were, were talking at, at the forum at the Agora in Athens, they were producing micro-credentials. Excellent, excellent. I like the way that we, as a Greeks, we saw the way so many years before. I will keep it. And thank you very much, Peter, for this um, uh, talk. Let's move to the next speaker. The next speaker um, demonstrates for me a similar characteristics with Nuno. With Nuno, uh, I, I, I introduced to Nuno very well during, you know, a fire bomb alarm in the in, in the airport of Warsaw. But the next speaker, I met him very well in a conference in the University of Leon, but we met and we introduced a little bit better during you know, the train, to take the train from Leon to Madrid. So I would like to welcome Hubertus Weyer from Wiesbaden Business School in Germany. Uh, he's a coordinator of the business, English and communication section. He's a previous um, spoke person in the German steel industry. His research topics include innovative uh, constructivist uh, teaching and learning methods, the intersection between communication and teaching, motivation and leadership, applied linguistics. He's very active, I would say very active in the virtual exchanges and the, and the um, establishment and launching of a joint, uh, not joint, because a coil is a joint by its definition, uh, collaborative online international learnings. And today he's going to talk to us about collaboration on all levels, coils and co-teaching as a novel approaches in internationalization, subject, subject specific teaching and learning as well as future skills. So Hubertus, the floor is yours. You can share your screen in order to start. You have 15 minutes. I hope Hubert here we scared. go. Yes, uh, ah, thank right. you very well, much. You scared thank me. Thank you very much for, for this very kind uh, introduction, Costas. I really appreciate it. I would also like to thank everybody for inviting me to this uh, conference. I, I love the uh, relaxed and open communicative atmosphere. Um, 
let me let me kind of uh, tell you what I'm going to talk about in the next 15 minutes. I have quite a few slides, but don't worry. It's 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 a story that I can uh, break down and uh, share with you. Uh, basically, you know, well, I'm I'm teaching at Wiesbaden Business School in Germany. It's it's located right in the middle of Germany, close to uh, Frankfurt am Main. Um, it's it's a department, basically a business department of the University of Applied Sciences. Our department has some 2,500 students. The uh, university as a whole has 12,000, maybe 13,000 students. Um, and Costa has already mentioned that I, I kind of come from two worlds. I worked in the steel industry for some time, for a number of years, but basically uh, I'm, a, I'm a trained linguist. <clears throat> and you can see that I, I worked in various places. Now, I'm presenting this, this talk that's beginning with collaboration on all levels, you know, collaboration on all levels. And we, we heard from Peter before that basically we're at a, we're, we live in a time when education needs to change. The, the book that you're seeing here, Creating the University of the Future, has a sentence in its, its foreword saying, current concepts of higher education do not confront the pressing challenges of our societies. Um, and I, I, I wrote down a few factors that we can all think of, you know, uncertain future, VUCA, you know, artificial intelligence, more and more digital, digitalization, globalization, uh, in Germany right now, we're experiencing a renegotiation of the service and the manufacturing industries. There's a transition to renewable energies. Uh, diversity is becoming, has been becoming more important politically and economically. So there are lots of factors that, that, that call for a change in our educational system. Uh, my, my job at Wiesbaden Business School is really you know threefold it's it's basically i got it only last year in april and and my job is basically to to combine internationalization business studies english and communication like these three legs if you will and normally uh, instructors like myself would have you know a number of hours to teach uh, students in, in this way. I don't. Uh, uh, my, my predecessor, uh, who worked in this position for 27 years, had 55 hours that he taught and that somebody else taught and a number of freelancers. I have only eight hours that are uh, integrated into degree programs. So we have only eight regular standalone classes, conventional classes, as we all know them, and uh, the big question is, you know, how can I integrate with my colleagues uh, from other subject areas and teach differently? Um, it was very clear to me when I saw this situation that, well, uh, it's not an easy situation, but also a big opportunity uh, to implement new things that normally are never or rarely implemented. And so um, I had this one class that's called intercultural communication, intercultural management, and I integrated a coil into that. You can see my, my uh, current cohort. Uh, we only finished teaching last week. So uh, talking to you is, is almost a spontaneous thing for me today. Um, so I integrated a coil into this class to, to, to test things a little bit. Um, yeah, um, this is another group from from a year ago that that was the the first uh, coil, large scale coil uh, that I did, and this class consists of basically a lecture, and it's it's not necessarily you know only a lecture. I would call it a seminar style type of lecture. There is um, a writing and presentation workshop attached to this because some of our students will you know still need to work on sort of their traditional english studies their writing skills their presentation skills that kind of thing and then there is uh, a coil uh, attached to the class so it's a very large class um, um and it, maybe you're wondering what what objectives what objectives am i pursuing in this class well first of all hands-on experience of working in an international team 
I put together, and you will see the faces in the moment, uh, three universities together with Wiesbaden Business School, another German university and two universities of Poland. And basically, uh, these four universities, um, you know, have students work in each group and students from each university have to work together so that that it's 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 actually a challenging situation everything needs to be done in english uh everything needs to be done digitally which is you know a reality in today's um uh, economy um it's it's an application of theoretical skills uh, some of our of, of the students that participate in the COIL may come from engineering, some from the natural sciences, some from business studies. My students would come from marketing, leadership, finance, accounting, that kind of thing. Um, what, what like, like one, one specific goal that, that I try to teach my students a lot is self-perception, being more aware of, of yourself and perception of others, of course. And then everybody needs to participate in a, in a large, uh, large scale international presentation where uh, the final project is, is presented. And then the ultimate goal that's very, very much at the bottom now is really developing reflective capabilities, reflective as opposed to only reproductive capabilities. How many exams did I have to give to my students where I had to in some way or another have them reproduce knowledge, or maybe they discuss things, but the discussion was very predictable and reflective capabilities, you know, supersede these old limitations. And a coil is, is a perfect uh, method to do that. Basically what I'm talking about here is future skills. Uh, I took, um, you know, a, a definition here from, from this book, uh, Creating the University of the Future. It's related to the individuals, so you saw that a little bit in the objectives, related to the subject, you saw that in the objectives as well. And of course, it's related to collaboration and co-creation. This is, uh, and it's so fitting that, that Peter was speaking before me, this is a certificate that uh, my collaborators and me issue to our students. Um, it's a micro-credential in a way. Um, and students are very, very much interesting, interested in, in attaining this um, uh, certificate because it, well, it makes their application documents look better. It's, it's an unusual, interesting extra, let's put it like this. And uh, so it's an incentive for my students. And some of my collaborators actually grade the final presentation uh, that students give. I don't but I do an, a reflective oral exam with them and then they can talk about their experiences during the COIL. Now, the existing COIL uh, that I have is uh, basically what you see on this map. It's between Wiesbaden, um, another university, TU Freiburg near Dresden in Germany, and then Silesian University of Technology and Wood University in, in Poland. So it's four universities. Um, quite a few students, um, uh, we would have typically 10 groups consisting of five to 10 students and about five students, uh, you know, finish per group. So 10 times five students. These are my collaborators, just so that you've seen them. Um, let me give you more of an impression how this is carried out. We, we work with Padlets. Uh, we distribute our, our uh, tasks to our students through uh, Padlet. This is already a full Padlet, as you can see. Um, people have to work through tasks. They have to meet deadlines. They meet on Zoom. They, they work synchronously and asynchronously. Uh, this slide gives you a little bit of an impression of one group uh, that presented only on June uh, 21st, uh, you know, only a few, few weeks back. They, they talked about um, I think uh, hydrogen mobility, and you can see very well that really students of all four institutions uh, work together. I uh, surveyed them and I'll show you some of that data, but I, I heard from some of these students, um, in fact, that they, they, they had disagreements and they resolved these disagreements. Uh, and that's of course 
uh, one of the skills that I I want them to learn that they they uh, you know basically uh, work toward a solution and resolve their differences. Um, just a week ago, um, somebody who participated in the coil posted the certificate on uh, LinkedIn. And I saw that by accident, and uh, the student, uh, you know, was very happy. A, a, a student of chemical engineering, in fact, and he was saying that, uh, you know, the, the coil helped him uh, Im improve maybe his his English skills a little bit, but also this experience of collaboration. Um, we we surveyed our students not only through course evaluations, but through a specific survey. And this is a question about what our students would recommend to the next cohort. And you can see lots of interesting words like group project, large project, speak directly, fun project, or active, people's behavior. Somebody said scared. Yes, it, it, people over, have to overcome hurdles in themselves to, to do this. It's part of the, the developmental process. Um, I'm particularly interested in questions five and six that you see here. These two questions talk a lot about uh, whether students want us as uh, instructors to intervene. Um, I don't want to do that because I think it is uh, intended that people resolve their differences independently, but we have a value and and this value is kind of in the middle and it changed between the two coils between the coil of 2023 and the coil that we did in 2024 and it went up a little bit so i in in that regard the coil wasn't as successful as i was hoping but it wasn't you know a problem or anything but what i'm 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 kind of showing you here is is that we can measure we can measure certain uh, learning outcomes and the progress that our students make uh, we, we can do that qualitatively, uh, but also quantitatively. And that's that's what I'm, I'm, I'm relating here. Overall, you know, how how do we achieve these <clears throat> learning outcomes? Well, we're moving from basically objectivist teaching to constructivist teaching. And that's the same as saying you you have a hierarchical style in your company and then you want to implement something that's uh, more like an agile style or a lean management kind of style, that kind of thing, more like self-organizing teams. So I instruct my students in, in lean management. I, you know, practice um, uh, conflictual situations with them. It helps them develop their, you know, speaking skills, their writing skills, but also their communicative skills. And it introduces them to you know a management approach so this this class is is is, is multifaceted in many ways um yeah um and then if you do that i introduce them to communicative models like this four sides model and and you know it makes people much more aware of the uh, you know cause and effect or the impact of oral and written communication in a in a corporate context of course uh you know, part of that is also intercultural communication. I include standard topics like high context and low context communication uh, and basically combine that in, in these exercises. And it, it raises awareness on the part of my students uh, regarding intercultural communication as well. Um, and beside, beside the uh, lecture and the sort of in-class exercises that we do this semester, I was able to integrate uh, five international guest lectures. This one in particular, this is a, a friend of mine uh, from San Diego. This one was extremely effective for my students because he related his own professional experience with uh, you know, colleagues and, and other professionals from India, and he described the differences uh, in in you know international teamwork very well. This this lecture is stuck, and I I know that my students will be talking about this guest lecture in in their oral exams a lot. Now you might be wondering, are coils are coils really effective? Uh, in June I attended a conference in Poland. You can see quite a few of the conference participants, 
uh, in the picture and I surveyed everybody who was at that conference and uh, like like this first question was um uh you know what what type of teaching style do people prefer objectivist teaching constructivist teaching or a mixture and interestingly nobody said objectivist teaching everybody erred on the side of constructivist uh teaching or or a mixture of both um and overall if we if we look at at these questions uh, the uh, result is that people this group that i surveyed here felt that coils are very effective um, um that um in fact um if if you if you had to mix um you know objectivist and constructivist teaching they would always err on the side of constructivist teaching predominantly and um, i'm personally working toward a somewhat more evolved approach to coils and that is taking coils out of this corner of only being for intercultural communication which they are and they're very effective in that but uh, coils can also be helpful as an alternative teaching and learning method in other subject areas including accounting i wouldn't mind doing you know uh, a coil in accounting or logistics or um, maybe math math uh, or chemistry and and the survey shows that people the, the group that i surveyed that they think this is possible now uh, uh costas how am i doing on time Uh, you have around five minutes. Five Max. minutes. Then I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, you, I'll, I'll I'll take you I'll take you into uh, another subject that's um, related to this overhaul uh, that, that we're kind of seeing at these Baden Business School. So the introduction of coils is is one major measure. The other big measure that we are taking is co-teaching, and I. It's, it's very new at this stage for, for Wiesbaden Business School. Last semester, we, we had our first two classes in co-teaching. Um, I'll talk about the two classes in a moment. Um, uh, and of course, there is a possibility next semester to, to combine a co-teaching class with a COIL. Um, so yeah, so <clears throat> what are, what's the objective of, of co-teaching? Well, it's a relevant alternative to the standalone classes, the classes that I don't have anymore. It's, you know, it's an opportunity to integrate subject, subject specific knowledge and future skills, as I, I laid, the, laid that out in, in my discussion of COILS. It's, um, for us in Germany, it's a possibility to teach bilingually. Uh, sometimes that's helpful. Last semester, we tried English only and English and, and German as a combination, but it could be English and French, English and Spanish, that kind of thing. It's, um, and I, I, I can back that up with uh, qualitative uh, data. It's, it's a more activating classroom atmosphere. It's more dialogical. Our students were saying that they appreciated this much more dialogical situation between the co-instructors. It's added value not only for the students, but also for the instructors. And I have backup for that as well. Of course, co-teaching is a sensitive uh, issue. Um, uh, you know, people have to agree on things. People have to be on the same page in many ways. Um, you can't do it unless you, you, you really want to do it. Um, and you need to have, um, you know, political support from your from your university. And the co-teaching could be done with an international co-instructor as well. Um, this is this is uh, a text that I, I I received from one of my co-instructors that he sent to the dean. And basically, uh, this you know uh, this co-instructor was saying. It was helpful because he was unsure about his own English skills. It helped him deal with a heterogeneous skill level in the class. It He thought co-teaching is something like we divide a class. You know, I do the first half, you do the second half. So he mentioned that co-teaching is significantly superior to sequential teaching. We, we, we tried both modes last semester a little bit, and the co-teaching mode was, was very effective. Uh, while the sequential mode was what we've known all along and wasn't, 
you know, dot new or dot effective. And to, to this co-instructor of mine, the idea of, of added value um, came out uh, really well. So we're going to expand and continue uh, this, this co-teaching class next semester. And then I did another class um, about basically human resources and leadership. And here you can see um, uh, students' voices and the students are basically saying it was refreshing. It was unusual. Uh, they described this class as, as a really interesting class. And the, the third person is saying that they would have liked to have more content from my side. I think, I think my co-instructor dominated a little bit, but it was also a very, in my mind, a very effective, a very effective uh, co-teaching situation. Now, uh, what's the outlook? for the situation at Wiesbaden Business School. Next semester, we're planning to do two or three coils. And I, I wrote this down. I, I'm using a writing tablet um, as for a change here. Two or three coils next semester and four, uh, four, four co-teaching classes. So we're expanding in both ways. Uh, and let me come back to uh, you know what I was talking at the very beginning, collaboration on all levels. We create a situation where there's collaboration, international collaboration on the level of the students, and uh, there's collaboration between instructors. And this is now uh, a very linked uh, and intertwined situation. And that's a big change to uh, the traditional approach, um, teaching and learning that we've had in this institution before. You can uh, quickly take a look at um, my sources at the most relevant literature that I've been working with so far. And of course, I'd be happy to share that. And at the very end, I would like to say, thank you very much for listening. And I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you very uh, much, Hubertus. Excellent. I, we have here an expert in co-teaching, but I will respond to here you know, later on. Let's start with the, the audience. Uh, Peter, the question is yours, and then we will move with the help of Elena to the questions through the chat. But first, Peter. Peter, the floor is yours. You need to unmute. You need to unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very encouraging. My first question uh, would be, uh, when can I register? <laughs> Uh, we're we're open. <laughs> you can you can register. You you can. I, I'd be happy to integrate you in, into one of my classes. Uh, I'm doing critical communication, a new format next semester, and the more established intercultural communication, intercultural management class. So you, you I'd be happy to have you in my classes. Ah, but no, that's great. But that leads me to the to the second uh, uh, to, to the. Uh, related question how how scalable is this because it sounds uh, fascinating but uh, uh, labor intensive eh? it's just like joint degrees uh, uh, fascinating but you reach uh, one percent of one percent of I, students by I, like right what do you think, I, do you think? <laughs> I, I a coil in my mind counts for a class so if you teach a class and then integrate another coil into it uh like my dean has agreed to give me one or two hours for doing the coil. So I'm, I'm compensated for doing the coil. If you do it like this, it is scalable for as much, um, you know, hours you have in your allotment. Um, okay, so, so you transform your existing offer. Yes. By, yeah. by, by making it coil. Right. And, uh, and, and uh, it, are we talking about existing? My last point is an existing offer or is it an add-on course? Is it extra credits that people earn or it's part of the 60 in a year? Um, I, I, I can speak to that. Right now, I'm working on integrating the coils into our module descriptions. Next semester, the coil will, in one class that's called critical communication, will be part of the regular credit. In this other class that I showed you today was an add-on because I needed to you know sort of start the political conversation yeah but Interesting. The, the 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 goal is to have it integrated as a regular teaching and also exam format danke <laughs> thank you and uh, let's give the floor to elena to to read the questions in the chat, and then I have a question to Hubertus as well. 
So the question here, the last question is what is FOIL? I can answer it. FOIL is collaborative online international learning or another way to describe virtual exchanges. Uh, maybe, Hubertus, you can also take a look in the chat and see which question, because we've got pretty uh, few oh questions boy. here. Maybe you want to pick your yeah. favorite. Okay, um, I'll, I'll begin. I'll begin. Uh, there is no I'll begin with the, the there first are one. How, how old? You how old are all of them. You're on time. <laughs> I'll work through this. Uh, how how old are my students? I have I have uh, first semester bachelor students, but I also have first semester master students. So they could be early twenties or you know mid to late twenties. Um, Okay, uh, the second question, are there credits given to the students for the COIL project? I can say yes, because basically that is something that I've implemented for the upcoming semester. Then the next question, let me just read it. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit complicated. Uh, I'm, I, that's a long question. Let me, let me, let me do that later. Um, what is COIL? Well, their, their definitions for COIL is basically a collaboration of students and instructors from geographically removed institutions, and it has to be at least two. Uh, that's I think that's one of the definitions that's that exists. Yeah. Ah, the uh, I think that's a question from Francis. Would you would you address challenges in developing countries? Yes, I, I, I don't think we have had that situation yet too much, but yes, of course, I think that's that's very important. Uh, most of my students, if they do their projects, they work in some way or another on sustainability. So uh, developing the situation in developing countries uh, is, is very important. And yes, I would address it. And maybe I have I have addressed it in in another way actually um, in an indirect way I'm, I think. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, thank you, Professor. This is Shalini uh, okay. from India, where we met at uh, uh, with the selection. We have we were there, and uh, you are talking about developing countries, and uh, we have uh, certain uh, projects uh, to address, and uh, it is good that uh, uh, we will go on with it, and I'll. Uh, uh, we can have coil and uh, since you have shown shown interest and also about the credits you have answered it yes of course uh, how to split the credits uh, and give it to the students who uh, who's actually into the coil and uh, who are taking the other subjects as electives and that is another area where we have to do uh, I think I feel that uh, from uh, when we are framing a syllabus we were uh, planning uh, in the curriculum how to split the credits and give it most important uh, uh, importantly we feel that credits should be given more for the students who pursue uh, these who are there undertaking the coil uh, do you think so that way uh, we have to give more credits to the students for undergoing oil projects yes i do well i issued a certificate yeah. to them and yeah. um, uh, yeah. they also have to do an oral exam with me so i i think my my system is pretty pretty rigid actually uh, but, okay. but but this is this is like a, a very technical question, and it, it takes a long time to really find an answer that fits to you on how you want to do it. So okay. uh, I I you know since we're in touch anyway, yeah. uh, I would yeah. suggest yeah. that we meet sometime and discuss yeah. sure. various sure. ways of of grading. Yeah. Because we have one more. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Okay. No, no, you can unmute yourself and ask, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Vertus, for your presentation. Very briefly, you mentioned that you got a reduction of two teaching hours to prepare a COIL course. Is this in the university do this for anyone who wants to 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 transfer a course into a COIL course? Are there restrictions? What is how, how do we convince your colleagues to do the same and move in this direction? Um, <laughs> I'm in the process of doing that. In November, I'm planning on doing an internal workshop, maybe with a few international guests who I, I'm going to invite. And um, I don't think we're at that stage yet where a significant number of other colleagues uh, want to do that, but I'm working toward that. Um, so it's the whole project is in its infancy, really. Okay, thank you very much. 
everything that is next at time, not because we need the value to stop the value uh, thing. Thank you. Um, let me check if I have any question myself. Ah, I have a comment, uh, Hubertus, that I faced. We face it. We face it during the accreditation of a joint master degree in under Mundus. I mean, regarding the learning outcomes, you, you show to us a certificate that you demonstrate what the students they have learned. However, I mean, if you would like this to be checked by a quality assurance, you know, like agency in order to be more transferable for the students that they have participated, the terminology should be specific. So I, I suspect that you, refer, you report to cycle one course, uh, bachelor. So I think that, you know, the, the way that you have described, it, described the learning outcomes should be more um, adapted to and aligned to Bologna process and the expressions that the quality uh, uh, assurance agencies, they recognize in order the students to be, uh, to be able to use it you know, easier. This is my I, just- I agree, I agree. And this is only a first version of the certificate. And, and there is a lot of work to be done. And there is one more question from the audience here. Please pass. Think about the future of education. When we talk about it here, hi. My name is Sami. I'm from the Western Galilee College. So, following up what Costa said, I would say uh, you started uh, your presentation with the, the name of the book, "The Future of Education," and I think um, it's it's more about the future of learning rather than teaching, because uh, our emphasis is mostly on the learner. It's learner-centered, right. and as to the learning outcomes. I would, uh, I think our emphasis is going, uh, uh, we're putting more emphasis on what the students can do with what they learn rather than what they have learned. It's doing something with what they have learned. At the end of the call, student will be able to. That's how, that's how I will define the learning outcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Hubertus also will be with us in October in the Erasmus days. And I will keep your idea to invite people. I think that this is a good recipe. People that they are planning and they are uh, executing and they have a plan about micro credentials, people that they are in COIL to come to have a, a network. And, you know, these experts to travel around the university in order to convince more people, you know, to implement. Because in my opinion, I think that this is one of the futures of the higher education for various reasons. So thank you very much, Hubertus. And let, let's you. move now to Professor Dr. Isaac Frumin from the Constructor University in Bremen, uh, in Germany. A uh, short uh, few things about the, the speaker. He is the head of the Observatory of Higher Education Innovations in Constructing a, a Constructor University in Bremen. His research include higher education, education in post-socialist countries. His work has received more than 3,000 citations and his age index is 27. Uh, the title of his contribution is Managed and Organic Diffusion of Generative AI in Higher Education in Search of Balance. I think as a tool, in the, as a tool, this you know, presentation matches very well with the title of the international track that we have, which is Virtual Internationalization, Pedagogies and Tools. So the floor is to Isaac. Isaac, are you with us? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. On, on, only one issue. Uh, it's not critical, uh, but I cannot show for some reasons. I cannot demonstrate the presentation. Uh, is it possible to to show it from? Uh, I have it. I, I think I think I have it. Uh, is I have it here, and I will share my screen. Uh, okay. And I will just comment and tell uh, you me, there are on, there are only ten slides, so we can move let, quickly. Let me, let, me, let, me let me maybe uh, uh, start uh, again. Uh, we uh, our university is quite strange, uh, small English speaking university in Germany. In fact, it's first. Uh, uh, private in uh, its second private university in Germany and first English speaking university in Germany. And, Just tell um, me if you can see the screen now. Yes, yes, okay. I see. I will, I, I I will follow your voice and I will change the transparency. Okay, thank you. So, uh, just uh, yeah, a, a few words. Uh, 
This university was no, um, it's very young. It was established, it's, it, op it was opened in 2001 and <clears throat> in Bremen as International University of Bremen. Uh, unfortunately, this model of private research intensive university is very difficult to survive. So uh, the university had to find a big sponsor. And in 2006, it became Jacobs University Bremen because um, Jacobs Foundation gave a huge grant and uh, provided continuous support for the university. Um, in recent years, after the pandemic, the Jacobs Foundation decided uh, to uh, stop the uh, university support of the university and we got a new major donor, uh, Serge Bell from Singapore, and he uh, established also a constructor uh, technology company, which is a kind of sister company. He's an um, entrepreneur in uh, IT. He is the founder and owner of a few really big companies in cybersecurity. And so why I'm telling this, just to stress that we work together with relatively big technology company to th uh, and it's, it shouldn't benefit just our university. We want to learn more about ed tech market, current trends of technologies and how they influence um, higher education. And this is why we started now a big study on what happens with generative AI in higher education. And the next slide, please. And we found that um, most uh, of, um, next, uh, the second slide, please. Yeah, yeah. That most um, uh, our efforts are concentrated in the area that we call managed adoption or top-down adoption. Uh, and um, in this case, we are talking about university policies or government policies. For example, we see new recommendations of European Commission on AI, where, for example, uh, universities are not recommended to use a recognition of emotion of a learner uh, for improving the results. It's prohibited practice. Practice so kind of we we kind of focus on that. But there is another big part of the reality which we call organic adoption because generative AI is a tool that is used by actors. Uh, who do not wait European Commission to uh, allow them to do that. Uh, I mean, students, researchers, teachers, and university managers. So the next slide, please. We went through the literature and uh, through uh, news aggregators uh, and indeed, uh, I will not open uh, in America if I say that we see the explosion of publications in this area. Uh, you see at these slides that only in Scopus database we see uh, super rise of the articles where keywords includes either AI, generative AI, or and higher education and universities. So we uh looked at we did a preliminary analysis of this of these um uh publications and we came to the following observations conclusions next slide please so you can see that um there are quite uh so in the area of managed adoption of generative AI we see uh, papers on institutional policies and guidelines, policy development, uh, curriculum about generative AI, uh, and 
a lot of papers, a lot of papers about academic integrity and ethical con uh, considerations. When we look at the papers on um, bottom, bottom up uh, attempts to use AI, we see uh, quite a few papers about uh, curriculum development, assessment with AI, and also students cheating. So we consider, in fact, uh, it's, it's really interesting when we also did a few interviews and we asked, how, what do you think how, we asked professors, what do you think how students use uh, the generative AI? The majority of responses were that uh, they cheat. They try to make AI to do uh, their homework, et cetera, et cetera. So we, uh, next slide, please. We, ask, we asked AI to create a picture of um, how we, sorry, how high education institutions see uh, this situation. And you can see that uh, professors are scared they talk more about risks and difficulties and students um, embrace it. Uh, so again, when we look not just to the topics, but uh, at, uh, on, on, onto the practical recommendations from different studies. Next slide, please. We can find that uh, the recommendations are to develop institutional policies and guidelines, focus on ethics, et cetera, and also uh, active curriculum integration of uh, knowledge uh, to develop skills and knowledge in area of machine learning. Uh, if uh, we, we look at the studies about um, organic adoption, what people do, uh, except uh, besides cheating, um, there are quite a few recommendations that we need to develop new tool, new skill, which are commonly called prompt engineering, and we have to develop the ability to self-directed learn. So frankly speaking, we see a big disbalance between uh, managed, uh, so most studies of institutional policies do not really pay attention to this organic adoption. They consider these initiatives by individual faculty, individual researchers, individual students, individual staff members as something that disturbed the picture. So, uh, yeah, it's it's normal. I I have been a dean, so I I do remember that I wanted everyone to use the same communication tool. But in uh, in light of uh, rapid growth and changes of technologies, this position uh, looks uh, as a weak position. I think so. Let me. Uh, go to the last slides and um, so we what we recommend next slide please is to look at um, uh, when we even talk about policies uh, not to concentrate on ethics and integrity even it's extremely important but cheating is not the only things that happens at, at universities uh, we think that we need to study the potential for training uh, specific professional skills among faculty and research. We need to do comprehensive comparative studies because uh, between universities, between countries, uh, between types of universities, and obviously we need to, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult, but we need to find some empirical evidence that um, uh, what works and what doesn't. And if we are speaking about organic adoption, we think that 
there is a big need in longitudinal study. Longitudinal, not in sense that we need something to study 50 years, but kind of continuous monitoring studies. Um, it would be, in fact, we plan to start it in September, and uh, we want to have a small group of students, and we will interview them every three months on how do they use different generative AI tools, uh, not just in their uh, classroom activities, but broader. We want to understand what skills they need, et cetera. And this, that's a second point. Uh, uh, yeah, we all agree that prompt engineering is an important, uh, as some people call it, new literacy. But we think that there is something more. For example, as one of my colleagues call it, we need not just critical thinking, which requires uh, to go deeply into arguments, etc., but we need to develop kind of an intuition uh, of uh, identifying illusions uh, or hallucinations of generative AI, identifying bullshitting. And uh, so, and then we have to think how to develop this new skill. So, and in general, as I mentioned, we need to do more on the balance between initiatives and um, top-down approach. So the last slide, uh, if we have, yeah, global consortium, yeah. So we, uh, I, I'm very happy to announce that in fact, three weeks ago, we, uh, a few enthusiasts met in Shanghai in China. We, uh, East China Normal University had a big conference on AI in education and uh, we found quite a few people, quite a few specialists uh, uh, who are interested in higher education. And we decided just to start an informal network, or maybe formal, uh, of colleagues who are interested in different practices of adoption of generative AI in higher education. We uh, want to use open sources to do that because a lot of information we can find on university websites, but we also want universe to encourage universities and individual professors to share their practices. So I would be very happy if after this conference, uh, more people will um, express their interest to participate in this kind of study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaac. You know, I think that we have a lot of volunteers, you know, that we would like to participate in this, uh, in this um, uh, study that you are doing. Uh, so we have some questions here. Uh, first of all, from Professor Nava Sak Saket, Saket from Holon, please. Uh, hi. Um, I'm Dr. Nava Shaket from Holon, Institute of Technology. I've been doing AI for several time, for several months and uh, decades, I, I can say that, but generative AI only lately. Uh, I think that uh, we need to look at what students need to do, but we also need to look at what teacher and professor needs to do. Meaning uh, the change will come when the professors will use uh, generative AI themselves and be proficient in it and show by example and lead by example. Only then, then the students will adapt and the students will not be afraid. The problem is with the institutional decisions and the efforts that needs to be put into changing the curriculum and changing the way we teach. So I can share with you that I'm teaching this week, every day, a workshop on, uh, on technology and I'm using only generative AI tools for the students and I allow them, not forbid, I allow them to use anything they want as long as they are accountable and re responsible for what they are saying. And I'm doing the reverse. And only by doing that, we will allow them to adapt. So it begins with us. And that's very important to, 
to first do it as a first stage before we even talk about the students. So that's my personal experience. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, I I just can hundred percent agree with you. Uh, this is very important comment, and um, we see that many professors, in fact, uh, are trying to use it without any pressure from uh, above. And uh, there is an interesting book of one of the members of our, our team, Professor Stephen Cosland from Harvard. Uh, he, uh, I asked him how he wrote it and he said, oh, I just uh, decided to try to use it for my psychology course and I decided to share this experience. So yeah, I think that uh, we can find the wealth of very interesting experience in what professors doing and encourage more our colleagues to experiment with it. Thank you. So Isaac, I suggest that you should share with us or send me an email in order to share it with the rest of the people. This uh, link of your network regarding the um, adoption of AI in higher education. So I think that now it's time to move to the next speaker, which is um, Nuno Escudeiro, Professor Nuno Escudeiro, um, a great colleague of ours. Um, he's a professor in Polytechnic Institute, Institute of Porto in Portugal. He's a professor in the Informatics Department of the School of Engineering of the Polytechnic Institute of Porto in Portugal. He's a researcher at the Games Interaction and Learning Technologies Research Center. He, he is the coordinator of the Athena European Alliance. Um, his research topics include engineering, education, machine learning. He's very active academic regarding education and research through Erasmus and beyond Erasmus. And um, actually, he's, I suspect, he's the leader and uh, the inspirator of the blended ed the gateway for global higher education in the digital age, a blended intensive program, a blended course, even before the blended intensive programs introduced through Erasmus to all of us. So Nuno, the floor is yours. Please share your screen in order to guide us you know, through your uh, experience. Yeah, I have 40 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you don't have 40 you minutes, Nuno, you have 15 minutes. Last five. <laughs> okay, very good. I'll do, I'll do it as well. Uh, Okay, let's let's move. So thank you, thank you very much for the invitation and for this uh, opportunity to uh, share with you all uh, what we have been doing in this uh, module, in this uh, pedagogical model, or in this uh, course. So I'll go very briefly through. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to fly over some uh, contextualization and then describe what we are doing in the course and let you know a little bit about the history of this that is already 15 years uh, long. So um, blended mobility now is finally being really acknowledged uh, by, by the, uh, under the Erasmus program. So I'm not going to bother you with the definitions that you all are uh, very much aware of, uh, I am sure. Uh, I would like just to go through uh, a vision or a way of looking at these things. So when we talk about uh, blended education, uh, we may be talking about, about many different things. In particular, what I would like to discuss with you is focused on blended mobility and in particular on a specific type of blended mobility. The blended mobility that, that where the blend is coming from the type of mobility that you are using. So I'm going to uh, talk about this blended course that we have, which is a course that is combining physical mobility where the students and the professors and the teachers are face-to-face -face with virtual mobilities that are done at a distance. And the, I, I would say that one of the main uh, uh, added value of the main one of the most interesting features of this model of combining mobilities is the fact that by combining, we, we, we leverage and we take advantage of the, uh, of the advantages of each one of them. Virtual mobility, as, uh, it's, it was 
yeah, you, we all have used this during the COVID years, and it, it it got a boost because we were forced to to that. But it lacks face to face activities, and face to face activities are those that promote certain behaviors and and de de develop cer certain attitudes between people that it's much harder to do when we are uh, communicating and when we are working online. It's through this uh, personal contact and it's through these um, face-to-face activities that we build trust, that we build responsibility and we get higher level of commitment to the tasks and to the colleagues. But physical mobility as a few barriers that uh, we are all uh, aware of. Uh, there are many barriers that we can easily identify, 10, 12 barriers to physical mobility. And there are many students that are losing the opportunity to benefit from the added value of uh, this international contact during their studies because they are facing these barriers. So physical mobility, although it is the most effective, let's say, to develop the competencies that you can develop through these international uh, contacts, they are blocked and many students cannot do them because of these uh, uh, barriers. And that's where uh, blended mobility comes in because blended mobility is an approach that you can overcome all these barriers and yet benefit from the, the 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 benefits that you get from the physical mobility to get a better sense of trust in your teammates responsibility and commitment for the task and for and for and for the colleagues and this is where the magic happens because when you have these activities with these two uh, uh, face to face you can overcome all this and get the, the best of both uh, ways the way we are doing this uh, in this blended course uh, is overcoming and is fixing this, this, all, all these issues. The, the main motivations that brought us to develop this way of teaching uh, in 2008, so it's 15 years now that we are running, we are going to start the 15th edition of the course next year. Um, we realize, and again, I, I believe this is consensual to all of us, project internship activities are a booster of, of, of the student's employability. It's through these activities that the students usually in the final semesters of their course that they have a chance to put into practice the technical skills they have acquired. And this environment develops soft skills in them that are very much harder to develop in the traditional uh, classrooms. And this is even more important if you can do this in an international setting, because this international expo exposure of the students when they are 22, 23, or around this age has a huge impact in their uh, personal development as professionals, as individuals, as citizens, and um, makes them get aware of cultural differences and all of these things that are really important to keep Europe tight together uh, as we all uh, want to, to this to happen. Then again, we have this, all these barriers that are preventing many students from doing so. And blended mobility overcomes all of these. And it was a kind of a surprise for us. It's also an eco-friendly approach. So this is green, green education when you compare this to a traditional Erasmus mobility. We did a survey a few years ago and we have requested former Erasmus students uh, and we asked them uh, how many times do they travel home during their Erasmus mobility. So we got more than 600 students from many 47 countries, and we reached to the conclusion that a standard Erasmus mobility is, in, in a standard Erasmus mobility, students travel back home uh, uh, on average 2.5 times, and with the model that we are using, with the course that we are using, the, they, they travel 70% of this, so we get in fact, a reduction of 30% in the carbon footprint with this model. So this was kind of, of, of a surprise. We are mainly addressing all these barriers and it was very nice to see that this is also a way of doing green education and a way of moving forward to sustainable education as uh, we are all uh, 
chasing for. So without, I will go to the details of the course itself in one minute, but before going there, uh, so why should we uh, bother to use this blended approach? There are many, uh, many features of this model that we have realized after all these years working in this project with many students with many different uh, uh, initiatives. It's really a democratic and a really European way of doing things because it promotes equity and it gives equal opportunities for all. The students that have that are facing these barriers to mobility that can never do in their during their degree uh, an Erasmus mobility, they can benefit from all of these international contacts during their studies in this approach. It tears, tears down all these barriers to the mobility. It's an eco-friendly, as we have seen, and you can easily adjust it to any study field without having to change anything in your curricula, without, without having to go on all those certification processes and accreditation procedures that are uh, quite demanding. Okay, now, Let's take a brief look at what the course is. So the, the main goal of this course is to create an, a, a teaching and a learning environment where the students can develop their employability, where the students can develop soft skills linked to communication, to international cooperation, to negotiation, and these type of things that are uh, um, wanted by the, by the employers. The target group of students, it's final year undergraduate students, and we usually give equivalence to the students through the capstone project course. What we do, we select the students for a given challenge. At this stage, we get challenges from companies that are there to be solved, and we can deliver these companies a proof of concept in the time frame of four months, which is a semester. So we create the teams, these teams are teams of students that come from different universities and from different study fields so that we can develop and put stu students uh, working together in a multidisciplinary and international environment, which has a big impact on the competencies that we want to develop. develop. We bring the, stud the students together all to the same place for a one week meeting where the students get to know the details of the challenge that the company the company is present there, explains the students what is the challenge, and the students meet together for the first time. And during this meeting, they agree on the way they will work during the semester. Because after this week, the students go to their own universities and they will keep working as a team, cooperating with each other to develop the challenge according to the principles they have agreed during this kickoff meeting when they were all together. And also the fact that we are bringing students not only from IT, but from many different areas. We have had already students from digital arts, marketing, management, sports, health, uh, hospitality. So many different areas, depending on the challenges, we bring in the students who have the competencies that are required to solve the challenge. And many of these students do not are not used to use IT tools and digital literacy is every day more and more important. So this is another added value of this way of doing things because the students during all the semester are communicating, are working in teams, are cooperating using all these tools uh, online, not only to do the meetings, but to keep the product they are developing in a central uh, repository. So during the semester, the students develop their course. And then in the end of the semester, we have another meeting with all the students one more week where the students do uh, their fine tuning they do the final pitch, they prepare their fine pitch, and they get assessed by the jury, which is constituted of the teachers that are supervising the students and the company. So I will go very briefly so to the, to the, the plan. So we have this course uh, organized in these three stages. There is a preparation stage, usually running between September and December. This is mostly teacher's task. We uh, open a call for uh, uh, incubation centers and for companies that are working with us and new companies that arise every year. We open a call for them to give their challenges. We select the challenges basing, based on the students that we have and based on, on the, 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 the value that we assign to each one of these proposals. Uh, and then we create the teams uh, and then we start organizing the kickoff meeting. So then we have the kickoff meeting one week 
the students go to their home institution for the rest of the semester and then they meet again for the final uh, for the final meeting it was also very interesting to realize during the covid that uh, at least here in my institution and in most partner universities when the covid happened no, I, I don't want to say all, but a big majority of the students that were on Erasmus programs, on Erasmus mobility, they came back home because of the lockdown. And this course was not, uh, uh, did not face an issue with that. So we continue the course, the course ended, and all the students were successful. What we did was just to have the final meeting uh, uh, in uh, uh, online and not face to face. And then in 2021, we did it completely online and it worked very well um, also. So I'll go because I'm running out of time. So I'm going just very briefly through uh, the path that we have run. So we started the first edition of the course was in 2009, 2010. The program was funded by the former lifelong learning program for two years. Then we ran the course on our own for four years. Then many things changed. So initially the project was only for IT students. Then we made it in the third year multidisciplinary. We started adding companies from 2013, 2014, because until then the challenges for the students were given by the professors. Uh, but then they, we got the companies in, which was great. Uh, and then from 2015, 2016, we started moving uh, outside European borders. So we had uh, uh, universities partnering with us from Russia, uh, from Iraq. Uh, and in 2017, 9, 18, we realized that there is a very good niche for this type of product, let's say, which is the niche of incubators and startups who usually want to have a fast proof of concept for some methodology, some product, some, and this is very keen to that. And now we are starting to go international for real. Uh, we had this year, we are just this week uh, closing the first edition of this course in Africa. We have six universities in Africa, two from Uganda, uh, Francis, uh, maybe uh, one of your universities, uh, two from uh, Uganda, two from Nigeria, and two from Mozambique. And we have just concluded the first edition of the course. And the plan is that uh, next year we apply for uh, a similar uh, uh, program, uh, but for the Asia area. The big ambition that we have is to have a, a, a pool of 60 universities and that there is a, a, a platform where the, the companies propose their challenges and the students from these partner universities apply to the, to, to the project, to the challenge they like most. And we do not know in advance who, who will be part, which students will be part in each team. We will not only know that at the end of the, of the, of the call for, for, for students. That's why, and so the big ambition is not to have one course in Europe and one course in Africa, it's to have one course that runs worldwide and that gets students from all the continents. Now we started moving to Africa, as I just told you, next year we plan to start uh, to move to Asia and to start creating this group of organizations to build this worldwide course distributed in all the, the continents. We have tools, uh, for all of these coming from all these years, currently we have a consortium of 23 universities and we have uh, resources, you can find videos, there is a Wikipedia page on blended mobility that was developed by the group of people working with us uh, under one of the Erasmus projects, uh, we have books and we, are, we will be very pleased to have new universities joining us, the consortium completely open. So if you find this interesting and you want to know more, or if you want to join, we'll be very pleased to have you on board. Thank you very much for listening. So, Enuno, thank you very much. Uh, please stop sharing your screen in order you know, to give the floor to questions. Very nice presentation, very insightful. I strongly suggest, you know, the universities to participate in this kind of education, in this blended course. Uh, I have a question, but pro first I will provide the floor to uh, people from online or offline if they would like to ask a question. I think Elena would like to uh, propose 
know, get somebody to participate. I will give the floor to Elena, she's next to me. So, Elena, the floor is yours. Okay, hello. Can you see me? I don't see you. They can see you. Okay. So you can check in that computer. I just wanted to see because I already have uh, collaborations with a lot of the universities and Costas is saying that this is possible to join and some kind of find the way. As, uh, so I'm connected to different academic institutions in Israel and beyond, but also I have a company that coordinates FOIL, virtual exchanges in different ways, pedagogically and you know, managing projects. So if there is a way for us to collaborate, I would be happy to. No, for sure. And we'll be very pleased too. So please just drop me an email. I can okay. put you in contact. We will okay. start next edition of the course. We have a meeting on the 4th of September and okay. uh, it can be a good opportunity for you to jump in this meeting and see how the vibe and feel it. So just drop me an email. It will be very good for us as well. Wonderful. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank so you. We have, one we, we have one more institution. Just Hi. No, no. Hi. It's oh, hello. Hi. 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 How hello. are you? How are you? Uh, uh, we have excellent experience with the blended mobility. We have done several. Uh, we, and we already have also established inside the institution a methodology. And uh, we have trained uh, some of our professors to, to really mentor the students. We have a methodology of how to choose the students for this kind of assignment. We, we, we would like very much to be in on that as well. So I okay, would drop you an email yeah. and uh, as well. Yeah, perfect. Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Waiting for it. Okay, no, no. So I want twenty percent. You know, uh, fee. You know, for this participation, I will become the manager. All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm kidding. So I have a, I have a. You know, for all the participants, all the transparencies and the presentations, they will be shared through the Impact Project website. You are going to receive an email from me tomorrow that I'm returning back to Greece. I will set up and I will share everything with all of you. Uh, I have a question to Nuno. Ah, Juliana, uh, the floor is yours. Juliana is a colleague from Ukraine, professor there, uh, and also is a part is a professor in KPI, with a partner in Athena. So, Juliana, please uh, uh, switch on your microphone and ask the question directly. Juliana, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. I cannot see a reaction. Uh, um, so I would like to ask you, Nuno, what is the biggest, you know, um, barriers uh, that uh, did you face during all these years in order to organize this blended course? And the second, my second question now is you, it has a call by itself, it's called BIPS. So it follows the same setup, uh, blended and online, they are raised, funding. Uh, so do the BIPS, you know, um, operate as a competitor to what are you doing? Uh, what are the unique things that people to select, you know, this blended course and not organize a bit? Well, you can. In fact, we are using BIP to uh, fund some of the mobilities of the students. So it's not, it's not competition. It's cooperation with this. And, and it's I would like to give an information on this that also countries that they participate in KA one seven one and they are your partners. The students also can move for a short mobility because until now there was a perception that the students they can move only for a semester. Now uh, the students actually since twenty twenty two this. Students, they can participate even for a short mobility. So uh, KA 171, also the students can be funded for this short mobility. Uh, the floor is yeah. yours, Nuna, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. And also uh, in relation to that, uh, there is a report, uh, uh, not a report, it's a guidebook from the commission when the BIPs were launched. And in this guidebook from the commission, uh, there is a mention to one initiative linked to these BIPs and they are referring exactly to this project, to the blended aim project that initiated all this. So it is it is seen as a good practice from also from that level. But yeah. going back to your question, yes, BIPs is a tool that we are using now uh, with this short mobility uh, to to take this further. Regarding the barriers, um, well, the barriers are uh, the funds that I, I would say that the main barrier because when people experience this, they get very much 
interested to continue, but then you need budget because we have to move the students and the supervising teachers to go to these meetings. So we are, this is probably one of the, the biggest issues. Um, we started using projects from grants. When you do not have grants, you have we have to find other solutions, either from the universities or uh, other, other ways. What we are doing for the last four years, we are asking the companies that for which we develop a challenge to pay a fee. It's a very small fee for the companies. It's not an issue here in Europe. We are charging 2000 euros per company and we are using this money to support the travel of teachers and students from the universities that do not have other sources of funding. But we are Excellent. using this also as a BIP. And, but of course, this depends a lot on the geography because you cannot think of doing asking companies to pay 2000 euros if you are in Africa, for instance, we are there now, we are discussing this exactly with, with our partners and it's a bit difficult. So we are trying to find other solutions there. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Nuno, for these insights. Uh, I will say that another another tip in order to, to continue this, because I totally believe that uh, this should be also recognized among the mobility numbers of the universities. Either is virtual exchanges or BIPs that they contain the mobile, the physical that counts. I think that you know what we should do as universities, and you, I think that you have already started, is like to write this kind. Of, how do we call it? Manifesto. How uh, the virtual mobility should be recognized, and as universities. Even you know a, a, a number of universities, we should develop a policy that we start to report these numbers. And by, by in in the future, I'm pretty sure that the national agencies they will recognize this and they will count the virtual mobilities. And you know, you know what is the biggest challenge? This 50 percent of mobilities that cannot be achieved with physical ones. Uh, that's 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 true. And then the. The fact is that, yeah, neither the national agencies, not at the European level, the several contacts we have done to for this to be recognized as an indicator of the international power of the university is not being achieved. But yeah, we are working on that and we will be very good to have more people on board for this manifesto. As you Thank you. So, excellent. So at this moment, I think that we should stop. We are half an hour late. A presentation about impact you are going to to follow it in the Erasmus days 2024 and um, I would like to thank all the friends because all of you you are friends uh, you are call you are first friends and then colleagues and then visionaries so I would like to thank you to thank you all of you for the support of your presentation there are a lot of excitement among the audience about your presentations and your insights and uh, I think that we can do more things, you know, in the future, in the close future, not in the in the future. Like we say in Greece, Avrio. I mean, this is close Avrio. Uh, I would like to thank you and be safe. And I will say also, whatever you have presented, particularly the blended, the micro credentials, the virtual exchanges, are very important also to address challenges that we face, like wars and distract and the disasters that they happened. And I think this is one more motivation in order to be more inclusive and to have a civic engagement footprint as a universities. I think that, you know, this, this um, shows the importance of your work. Thank you very much. Have a nice night and speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye, Peter. I will call you when I will back go back and back. <laughs> I will call you to the way back to Greece. Missing, Karen.